Sorry for such a long wait, my paleontology fans. Paleo Profile is finally back after hiatus, and we got a good one today. The Triassic long neck Weirdo, Danny Strophius. So let's just get into it. After the extreme severity of the Permian mass extinction, the death of the ancients, such as Ripterids, Labyrinthodon amphibians, Trilobites, Therapists, and many, many more animal groups and species, many of the once-filled ecological niches were now completely empty, open for the survivors, allowing for bizarre experiments of evolutionary radiation and a display of the true scale of the diversification of life. Rivaling that of the Cambrian explosion, this Triassic explosion allowed for the evolution of many, many new body plans, from the very first pterosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, dinosaurs, and crocodilians, and yes, even animals like Tanystrophius, one of the outlandish ones of them all. Tanystrophius, meaning long vertebra, was a large 20 foot long proterosaur, living during the mid Triassic period, about 245 to 228 million years ago. During this time, the entire planet was still very much one supercontinent. As a result, Tanystrophius fossils have been found from Italy to China. First described in 1852, Tenistrophius would be misinterpreted and reconstructed incorrectly multiple times in history. In 1886, it was believed that Tenistrophius was a pterosaur with a long tail. And in 1878, it was believed to be a species of Iguanodon. We now know that Tanistrophius wasn't a pterosaur or a dinosaur, but was in fact an archaeosaurmorph, meaning it was a reptile closer related to crocodilians and dinosaurs than to lizards. As a proterosaur, Tanistrophius' closest relatives were also oddballs as also some of the most bizarre Triassic animals to ever have existed. These included the reptilian sloth monkey anteater, Trypanosaurus, the hind-limbed wing Charvectorex, and the long-necked glider, Mesistotraculos. Proterosaurs were probably the most diverse groups during the Triassic and yielded some of the strangest members, and Tanny was just like its cousins in its weirdness. The best modern analogy I can make to compare Tanystrophius is that it was a crocodile trying to be a heron. It's utterly bizarre. The most interesting and identifiable of its features is its super elongated neck. This neck took up 10 feet of their overall 20 feet of the body, meaning it was longer than the body and tail combined of the animal, and atop that towering neck was a head filled with sharp teeth, obviously used for piercing prey items. This was a predator. A long neck predator. In addition, it had relatively long legs with five digits on each hand, a relatively short tail, and a head that would look almost triangular from the top. And 2005 skin impressions let us know this animal was covered in rectangular, non overlapping scales. It was big, too. Picture a reptile the size of a large crocodile, but with a neck that takes up over half the body, walking around on land. More on that later. So, what was Tanistrophius' role in its environment? Where did it live? What did it eat? And how did it use such a long neck and why? Well, let's answer those first two questions. What was Tanistrophius' habitat? Which has been a bit of a debate for a while. Many scientists suggested that Tanistrophius would have been unable to survive on land due to its long neck that would make it top-heavy and unbalanced, and that the pressures of gravity would make movement on land impossible for Tanny. They believe that Tanistrophius to be an exclusively aquatic animal spending most of its life in water. But this conclusion is almost entirely incorrect. Paleontologist Mark Witten examined Tanistrophius' body mass on his blog post and concluded that Tanistrophius wasn't that front heavy at all and could definitely support its massive neck on land, as well as the animal being very poorly suited for an aquatic lifestyle. Let's first start off with the neck. Mark was able to calculate that the neck and head made up 20% of the overall mass of the entire animal. Now what does that mean exactly? Well, 20% isn't much at all in the grand scheme of things, and that means Tanny had the rest of the 80% of its body, tail, and limbs to support its neck. If we compare this percentage to long-necked astrichid pterosaurs such as Sejangoteris, one of the few long-necked terrestrial carnivores and probably the best comparisons as far as neck length to Tanny, its head and neck took up a whopping 50% of its overall mass, and obviously didn't topple over when it was out of water because it definitely wasn't aquatic. We can conclude from all this that Tanystrophius did not require an aquatic environment to survive, and could indeed support its long neck on land and out of water. At least one non-aquatic mesozoic carnivore seems more front-heavy, but it obviously did not require water to support its neck or head. Soft tissue preserved in fossils has confirmed this as it revealed that a large black mass of muscle was found in the hips and base of the tail of Tanny. This suggests that the animal's center of gravity wasn't in its neck, but in its hips and tail region. Such large muscle mass would shift the animal's weight and allow stability and balance to its massive neck when the animal moved on land. Further evidence has revealed Tanny is very poor adapted to an aquatic lifestyle as well. Tanny has surprisingly long and slender legs, which are extremely ill-suited to function as effective paddles. Its tail is also short and broader than it is tall, meaning it wasn't an effective propulsion organ either. Not to mention that horribly long neck, very ill-suited to swimming. The entire animal, needless to say, is surprisingly non-hydrodynamic. 
Not to mention its bones are hollow, a trait one wouldn't expect from an aquatic animal. Just comparing the limbs of the aquatic proterosaur, Dinocephalosaurus, with that of Tanistrophius, one can clearly see the wider arms and legs of Dinocephalosaurus are way more effective flippers than the thin and slender arms and legs of Tanny. Now, that doesn't mean Tanny was entirely terrestrial. Some traits do suggest Tanny was somewhat aquatic, such as the elongation of the fifth toe, which is uncharacteristic with that of an entirely terrestrial reptile, but common among aquatic animals. So, from all this, we can gather that Tanistrophius was more adapted to a terrestrial lifestyle living mostly on land and not mostly in water. It might have spent some time in water, but was definitely not restricted nor entirely at home in an aquatic environment. Mark Witten says it best when he says that Tanistrophius' anatomy seems to be more suited to terrestrial locomotion with some aquatic leanings rather than sustained aquatic propulsion. So, Tanny was at home on the coast of Triassic Seas. Other evidence shows that also rivers, estuaries, and lagoons were homes of Tanistrophius's too. This is supported by fossil beds where Tanistrophius's are commonly discovered, where they are often found alongside many marine fish and sea-going reptiles, as well as terrestrial or freshwater species such as Temnus bottles, terrestrial reptiles such as lizards, stem mammals, and plants, and a number of locations. Tanny lived around water, but was not restricted to it, and definitely spent more time out of it than in it. Much like a stork or heron, you definitely wouldn't find it floating around out in the open ocean. For this reason, Tanistrophius was a bit like Carnotaurus, as it is unique and stands as an outlier in all of Earth's known history, as one of the very few long-necked terrestrial carnivores, with the only comparisons being the long-necked astrakid pterosaurs and some species of birds. Now, what did Tanny eat, exactly? Well, that question will also answer what the use of the long neck was. The gut content of Tanny was preserved. It revealed that Tanny Strophius ate a diet consisting of fish remains and cephalopod hooks. This diet is consistent with that of many species of coastal birds, such as herons, which I might add also have very long necks. Now, the neck of Tanny Strophius was composed of a rather few amount of extremely elongate vertebra. 13. Now that's not a lot of vertebra at all. It's a far crime for most dinosaurs which have an insane amount of vertebra, and most marine animals with long necks possess more than double that, and that the vertebra are smaller, allowing for more flexibility. This is not at all the case in Tandy. The size and number of the vertebra would have made the neck extremely inflexible and stiff not allowing for much range of motion at all. The most motion seems to come from the base of the neck, meaning the animal could dip its entire neck up and down like one of those drinking bird thingies. This is of course not mentioning the large amount of muscle mass in the rear and hips that would have given stability and a counterbalance to the section of the body outside of the water, so that it wouldn't launch itself into the water when the animal struck. And I think you know where I'm going here. The neck obviously was used for coastal fishing from the shallows or even land. The standing theory among scientists, including Witten, is that Tanistrophius was a living fishing rod that sat on the shore or the sides of bodies of water and dangled that massive neck above the water, waiting for a fish or squid to swim by and wham, a meal. The fact Tanny's forelimbs are significantly shorter than its hind limbs also seems to support this hypothesis, as the front limbs would have naturally been closer to the water's edge when feeding. This is remarkably similar to the adaptations of modern herons, just on steroids. Just on steroids. 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 A scene like this would be the last thing an unlucky fish would have seen. Bizarre adaptations for catching fish just as weird as Tanny exist today. The black heron, for example, uses the shadow casted by its wings to attract fish. An interesting speculation by Joshua Kapu is that Tanny did something similar and possessed extendable membranes on the sides of its neck to shade the water. A strange mix of a cobra and a black heron, which aided in catching its prey. This is just mere speculation, but nonetheless an interesting suggestion and plausible considering relatives of Tanny Strovius have done weirder things with their skin membranes. Regardless, the usage of the extravagant neck is obvious. It was most likely, well, like a fishing rod that allowed the animal to stay on land by the water's edge but catch prey underwater staying high and dry when it gets its meal. It was basically the prehistoric version of the mythical Scylla of the Odyssey fame, a long-necked monster that could snatch up unlucky victims in the sea below from its rocky platform. Mark Witten theorizes that Tanistrophiuses spent most of their time on the shorelines of Triassic Earth, waiting to snatch prey. A sight like this, a large adult waiting patiently for the right chance, would be common. Note some other Tanistrophius off in the distant, further out at sea perched on some rocks, which would require a short swim to access. This crocoheron, as Witten calls it, would just be a massive reptilian version of our modern herons and storks peaceful watchers that snap at just the right moment, and then swinging its monstrous neck back to shore with the bounty. Tanistrophius didn't have much to fear as it was one of the largest in its environment. As many fossils have been found in the Bissano formation in Italy, Tanistrophius shared its habitat with animals such as 
Sorichthys, or lizard fish, a beaked predatory fish that feasted on pterosaurs. Bisonosaurus, a very large ichthyosaur that was 6 meters long which patrolled the waters. Tisonosaurus, a terrestrial armored archosaur, or crocodile relative. And Nothosaurus, seal-like aquatic reptiles. Tisonosuchus might have possibly been an enemy of Tani. Unfortunately, even for all their weirdness, the crocoherons haven't been featured much in pop culture. The only one to my knowledge being chased by sea monsters with Nigel Marvin, where the show seems to lean more with the older, now outdated theories concerning it, by depicting Tanny as a primarily aquatic animal, we more likely find Tanny on land, along the coastline, not completely submerged underwater. One of the most blaring inaccuracies is when Nigel Marvin basically commits animal cruelty and tears off Tanny Strophius's tail. Our hero, everybody. He says the tail will grow back like a lizard, but the thing is, that is completely wrong. Tanny Strophius was an archosaurmorph, not a lizard. They can't shed their tails in defense. Meaning, yes, Nigel Marvin, you probably just killed a defenseless animal and will most likely alter the course of evolutionary history. Congratulations. Well, regardless of its lack of pop culture entries, I like you, Tanny. You are one of the weirdest things that have ever existed and you need more recognition. I just find it fascinating to imagine this giant swinging its neck across the shoreline in search of a meal, scales basking in the sun on the most beautiful Jurassic beach in the world, as other Tannies rest in the shade next lying in the sand. Alrighty, that was Paleo Profile Tanny Strophius. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something. I know I did. Thank you so much for watching and I have big plans for future videos on everything from aliens to globsters to Loch Ness Monsters to dinosaurs. Hope you see you in the future. Like and subscribe. I've been Trade the Explainer and have a great day. See ya.